We're going to be talking about Noah this morning. We're in our series through the book of Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to go ahead and get it out of the way real quick. I know a guy. Okay, anyway. Um, and so Hebrews <laughs> chapter 11. Um, and and, and we, we know, many of us know the story of Noah. What did he build? An ark, right? He built a pretty big boat. And, um, and, uh, and he did that in response to a warning. And I think this is kind of fitting. I think this is kind of fitting, uh, a fitting message uh, for Mother's Day, because one of the things I was thinking, I, 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 I talked to Kristen uh, this past week, and I was like, okay, I need your help with starting out the message. And, and here's, what, here's what I said. I, was, I said, I, I need to know some of those times where you warned me about something, and I, and I still did it, and you had your I told you so's. Right. And so I think I think we had that conversation like Wednesday or Thursday. And I said, I don't need to know right now, but just by Sunday morning. And so we were driving on the way to church this morning. And, and, and I said, OK. Hit me, give me a couple of the stories. Right. And and she's like, there's so many moments where I've had to say I told you so that I just can't like pick one out. Like I know there's some good ones there and I just can't pick one out. And so I was kind of on my own, but I was thinking this morning and, and, and kind of over, over the last week about those moments where, um, uh, you know, specifically on Sunday mornings when the kids want to bring things to church, right? Or um, like they want to bring this toy or they want to bring this doll or they want to bring this something. And I remember specifically one time that one of the kids wanted to bring something, and I said, I really don't think it's a good idea for you to bring that. It's going to get lost, or it's going to get broken, or it's going to, you know, something's going to happen to it, and I just really don't think you should do that. Well, in a shocking turn of events, she did it anyway. And guess what happened? Let's just say it did not come home in the same condition that it left with, right? And so what is the parent's response in that moment, told you, right? Daddy knows everything, right? And, or, or something like that, something along those lines, right? I told you, you know, and all, all that stuff. And you, you kind of get a little frustrated. You kind of get a little, you know, because she's upset. Now you're upset because it, it, it's just a whole big thing. And, and I thought about how I'd had a similar conversation recently and then went to play golf and I was playing golf and, and if you know and, and, and I'm trying to be a little prophetic here because the weather is just like on that line of perfect golf weather you know what I'm saying and so and so maybe if I talk about golf from the pulpit God will shift that and it'll just be mid-70s all week long and we can go play golf but um, I, I was playing I was playing golf recently and um I was playing with Kristen's uncle, John, and we were playing in Florida at a couple courses that he was really familiar with. And if you know golf, you know that if you're playing with someone, um, they'll, they'll, may, they'll maybe try to help you line the putt up, right? And so he told me on two holes back to back, hey, if you putt it right here, it'll go in the hole. I didn't believe him. And so I putted it a little bit outside of where he pointed, and guess what? I missed it a little bit outside. And he's like, if you would have putted it. And, I, and, and he told me twice. And I remember being really frustrated on my end because I didn't listen to him, right? The guy that lives in Florida, the guy that plays these courses all the time, right? He's trying to help me and show me where to put the putt. And then I don't listen to him. I don't trust him. And so I, I think I know better, right? And so I, I put it my way. And guess what? I miss it. And I had the thought while I was playing golf that day, after two putts in a row that I missed that I could have made if I would have just been a better listener, wow, I am not that much better of a listener than my nine-year-old or my ten-year-old or maybe even my three-year-old. And I wonder if you've had any moments like that. Some of you guys are like, no, no, no not me, not me. Stop the elbowing. Okay, that's not nice. But we, we all have moments like that. What makes Noah's story so special is that Noah was warned. We're going to look at how Noah was warned that, that a flood was coming. 
And everything hinged for Noah on how he was going to respond to this warning, right? He was, he was getting alerted that, hey, there's a flood coming. It's going to wipe out the whole earth. If you want to do something here, you can do something. You can save yourselves. You can put animals on. You're kind of my hope, right, for, for um, repopulating the earth and, and all of that. Like, like I'm going to wipe everything out, but no, you're, you're going you're gonna to live if you do this. And one of the biggest things that I see in faith in Noah's story is humility. That faith takes humility. Because Noah, right, Noah, he, he, he's, he's, he's building this ark, this huge ark, and we're going to look at the dimensions of the ark, and we're going to see how big this ark really was, but, but he would have been ridiculed, he would have been criticized, people would have thought he was crazy, right, for, for responding to this warning in the way that he did, and yet he did. He did. He responded. Hebrews eleven seven, where we see God remembering, right, remembering the faith of Noah through the writer of Hebrews. It says, by faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, in reverent fear, the humility piece, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Now we may sit and think, yeah, you know what? You can't really compare the putt, right, that you didn't listen about, or the, the toy or the doll or whatever it is, or, or this or that. But, but you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about quite a lot lately is being faithful in the little things. Being faithful in the little things. I once heard a story uh, of Rick Warren, uh, a pastor of a small church out in Southern California, and, uh, and, and, and Rick Warren uh, uh, w- was telling the story, and he was, he was recounting his, he and his wife Kay, their, 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 uh, their tithing philosophy. And, and every year of their marriage, and I, I don't remember at this point how long they've been married, but they've increased their giving. They've increased their giving. And he was sharing with a room full of pastors, not even his church, he was sharing with a room full, room full of pastors about stewardship. And he said, he said, you know, we, we give back to the church, right? And he's at the point now where he doesn't even take a salary from the church. He's like, but we give out of book sales and all that because he sold some books um, over, over his time. And, and he's like, we give like 90% of our income back to the church. I'm like, wow. You know, it started at 10 and then it like went to 11. And he's like, some, some years it was lean and some years it was, it was good. And so we'd make a bigger jump, right? And so, and so but anyway, he was sharing this. And, 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 and I was thinking it because I was sitting in my living room, like live streaming this conference with a bunch of pastors out in Seattle. And, and, um, and I'm, I remember sitting on my couch thinking the thought, well, yeah, if I wrote a New York Times bestseller, like I would give a bunch to the church. And Rick Warren, sitting in a chair talking to a bunch of pastors, he says, I know what you're thinking, that if you wrote a New York Times bestseller, you would give that much back to the church. And he's like, but you wouldn't. You want to know why you wouldn't? Because you're not being faithful now in what you have. And so maybe God's not blessing you because you're not being faithful in the little that you have. And so... These little things, right? These little things where we're like, okay, God, you want me to put the put, you want me to put the putt there, you want me to put this there, you want me to entrust you with this. That's a small thing. And yet we wonder why God won't entrust us with the bigger things. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, right, wiping out the whole earth in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. That comes by faith. Became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. For the story of Noah, many of you probably know this, we flip back to the book of Genesis, 
and, we, and we, we're going to start in verse 6, and we're going to fly, and we're going to try to hit. I, I, I spent a lot of the beginning of the week trying to figure out, okay, there's so much that we could talk about with Noah and his faithfulness to God, and, and, and so we're going to try to look at, at quite a bit of Noah's story this morning together. So we're going to start in verse uh, 11 of Genesis chapter 6, and we're going to see that God spoke to Noah through his word. Right, the four things that, that, that all of these stories from Hebrews chapter 11 have in common. God spoke to them through His Word. Their inner selves were stirred in different ways. They obeyed God and God bore witness about them. So we're going to take that outline and we're going to roll with it. So Genesis chapter 6 starting in verse 11 goes like this. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence. God saw the earth and behold it was corrupt For all flesh had corrupted their way on earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. For the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them from the earth. And so God was disgusted with things that were happening on the earth. God was disgusted with things that were happening on the earth. It was filled with violence, corruption. And and God comes to Noah and says, I've determined, I've made my mind up. I am wiping this clean. Verse 14. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, and which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you, and of every living thing of all flesh. You shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Now, let's just pause real quick and have a little fun with this. They could have left the snakes on the earth and not put them in the ark. Amen. I mean, I know we don't deal with that in Maine like we dealt with that in North Carolina as I was growing up. But come on, I think of that every time I read this. Like, God, there are some things we could have left off. Mice, snakes, spiders. What good are spiders? Some of you guys are like, Micah's great at that because she just studied spiders in school. And she's like, Daddy, spiders kill other things. And they're they're really good for the earth. And I'm like, Micah, not everything you learn is helpful. (laughs) Where were we? Okay, verse 20. Of the birds according to their kinds and the animals according to their kinds. And here it is, here it is. Of everything, of every creeping thing of the ground. Like why? Every creeping thing of the ground, that's actually there according to its kind. Two of every sort shall come in to keep, uh, to you to keep them alive. Verse 21. Also, take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. So God spoke to Noah, right? God warned Noah, said, hey, there's corruption. I'm going to wipe it clean. But here's the deal. Make for yourself an ark. Get two of every animal, right? Get plenty of food and hop on the ark. So the flood was coming, right? The flood was coming. God had warned Noah here, hey Noah, this is coming. And, and, and here are the dimensions for the ark that God told Noah to build. Um, out of gopher wood, gopher wood, 450 feet long. 450 feet long. 75 feet wide. 45 feet high. It had three decks one door and a series of small windows, 18 inches right under the roof, providing light and ventilation. This vessel was designed, this vessel was designed for flotation. It was just a floating device. It wasn't designed for navigation, okay? It wasn't, it, it just wasn't designed for that. It was a huge wooden box that would float, that could float on the water and keep the contents inside safe and dry. Dr. Henry Morris calculated that the ark was large enough, 
this, this, this gets me every time, that the, that the ark was large enough to hold the contents of over 500 livestock railroad cars. Over 500 livestock railroad cars providing space, ready for this, for about 125,000 animals. Providing space for about 125,000 animals. In short, there was plenty of room for everything that they would need. Plenty of room for everything that they would need. Plenty of room for everything that they would need. Now, let's go back to the humility piece. Okay, Moses hears from God, right? Warned from God, I'm going to wipe everything out. But here's the deal. You start building this ark out of gopher wood, 450 feet long, 75 feet high, 45 feet wide. Did I get that right? 45 feet, high, 45 feet high, 75 feet wide. I think I got that right. Three decks tall, right? The pool was probably on the third deck because that would make the most sense. But anyway, and yet Noah was the only one. His family would have been the only one that were clued into the fact that this was going to happen. Can you imagine the humility that this family would have had to live with when they were getting criticized for building this type of device, this type of floating device, this type of ark, right? Based on hearing from God. What would that look like today? I mean, we looked a few weeks ago at a definition of faith. Faith is confident obedience to God and His Word no matter the circumstances or consequences. And so Noah heard from God. God spoke to Noah in this way. And then we see their inner selves were stirred in different ways. I think one of the biggest verses in the story of Noah is chapter 6, verse 22. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Everything that God had just spoken to Noah from verses 11 through 21. Everything that, that God had just warned Noah about and said, hey, build the, the ark, make, make these rooms, make it three stories high, make the one door, make the windows, all, all these different things, right? Everything that God commanded, Noah did. Noah's faith that he's commended for in Hebrews chapter 11, Noah's faith involved his whole person. Noah's faith involved his whole person. His mind was warned by God, right? His understanding. He, he had an understanding with God, right? He had heard God's voice and his mind was warned by God. His heart was moved with fear. His being was moved with fear. A healthy fear, right? If God is who he says he is and does the things that he says he's going to do, then I ought to build this ark. Otherwise... Otherwise, there's not a lot of hope. Right? And so his heart was moved with fear. And then one of the biggest ones that I think we miss, right? One of the biggest ones I think that we miss and where it may be stopped for us, I think we may hear from God. I think our hearts may be moved um, uh, with some things. But then we see his will acted. His will acted on what God told him to do. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. What a powerful thing. What a powerful thing when our whole selves are stirred for God. What a powerful thing when our whole selves are stirred for God. Noah knew his heart was moved and his will acted. I was thinking about the story from Francis Chan. I know I've shared this many, many times before, but Francis Chan was having a conversation uh, with his, his son about cleaning his room. And so his son goes up and, and, and spends some time in his room and comes back down a couple hours later and he says, hey, listen, Dad, I want you to know, I thought about what you said. 
I, I even pulled out the, the dictionary and looked at the Greek of what it really means to clean your room. He said, I've got some friends coming over later and we're going to talk about what it would look like if I cleaned my room. You know what hadn't happened? He hadn't cleaned his room. Right? How frustrated would that make you as a parent? Whew. But yeah, how many times does God do that with us? We understand, right? I mean, his son, you know, had to, and I don't know if that's a true story or just something that, you know, Francis kind of came up with, but, um, but you know, uh, there was an understanding, right? I understand what dad is asking me to do. Dad is asking me to clean my room, right? I, I, I know w- what it would take, right, to, to, to be moved that. There's a fear, right? If dad doesn't, if I don't, if dad asks me to do something and I don't do it, then there, there, there could be a healthy fear involved, with that, right? And then, and, then, and then His will would move to action as a result of that healthy fear of what might possibly happen, right? And so there's an understanding there, but the, but the reality is at the end of the day, He understood, He was moved, right, to go to His room, but nothing happened. But nothing happened. But nothing happened. Maybe you're in that place today where you've heard from God. You understand exactly what God has called you to do. I've heard some incredible things, right? And, and, and there's, a, there's even a fear surrounded with what you're being called to do. There's an intimidation factor that if I really do this, I could lose some friends. If I really do this, if I really take the stand, it could mean some things for me. It could impact some things in my life. And God's just waiting on you to act. God's just waiting on you to act. What a beautiful thing when our whole selves are stirred for the things of God. So we see that Noah heard from God. We see that Noah was stirred. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him to do. And then number three, Noah obeyed God. Noah obeyed God. Look at verses uh, 1 through 24 of chapter 7. We're going to try to get through all this, but I may skip around a little bit. I'll try to keep you posted. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I've seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals and male and, and maid and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, the seven pairs of the birds of the heavens, also male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made, that I have made, I will blot out from the face of the ground. Oh, there's so much we could talk about with this. Verse 5, and Noah did, here we see it again, Noah's faithfulness, right? Noah did all the Lord commanded him. Get this, there's no excuse. Noah was 600 years old. Noah was 600 years old. There's no excuse. The people, that, the people that come into church, right? Oh, man. The people that come into church and say, oh, I've done my time. It's time for others. No! That's not a thing. If you're still breathing, God wants to use you in His house for His family, for His glory. That's not a thing. I'm glad we got one that's listening. Either that or you're just tickling her. But that's fine. Don't tell me the real thing, okay? Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood of clean animals and of animals that are not clean and of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground. Again, we could have left those out. Two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded Noah. Noah heard, Noah did, Noah obeyed, Noah responded through his stirring, and after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the seventh day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst Forth, and windows of the heavens were open, and rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. 
On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, uh, uh, and Noah's wife and, his, and the three wives of his sons, with them entered the ark, they and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing, again, there it is, we could have left those out, that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah to and two of all flesh in which there was the breath of life and those that entered male and female of all flesh went in as God had commanded him and the Lord shut him in. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth and the ark floated on the face of the earth and the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the mountains under the whole earth were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains covering them 15 cubits deep and all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Man and animals, creeping things, and the birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him on the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. God did what he said he was going to do. God did what he said he was going to do. Man, can you imagine? Can you, can you imagine being one of those ones sitting on the ark, knowing the things that God had spoken to Noah? With everything going on around you outside of that boat. God did what He said He was going to do. They obeyed God. There was, a, there was a week of waiting. The first ten verses there in that passage, we see a week of waiting. So uh, the, the Bible gets pretty specific. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, right? And we get specific, right? Since the rains started on the 17th of the month, it was the 10th day of the month that Noah and his family moved into the ark at God's instruction. During that final week before the flood, they finished gathering the animals, they finished putting their supplies together, getting everything together, but the reality is, and the point is, and the thing that I want you to see this morning, is that they followed God's promise. They trusted His promise. And they knew, they had faith, they had confidence that there was nothing to fear because they were acting in obedience to God. One year and ten days later, the same God that closed the door opened the door and invited them to come out and live on His freshly cleansed earth. They obeyed God in the waiting. They obeyed God in the middle. There was a day of reckoning, a day of judgment, right? The flood was God's judgment of a wicked world. God opened the floodgates of heaven so that the rains came down, so that the highest, that even the highest mountains were covered by water. God had waited over a century for people to turn from their wicked ways. And then we see Noah's family, yet again, Noah and his family spent one year, 17 days on the ark. And even though, even though, even though they had daily chores to do, I mean, think about it, 125,000 or so animals, give or take, it's a long time to be in one place with a group of people. Like, let's, let's just think about that for a second. Look around. What if I told you we were about to spend one year and 17 days together on a boat? Locked. Nowhere to go. I mean, granted, pretty big boat. You might be able to hide with the cows for a little bit, but we're going to find you. You ready? I love you. But no. That's a long time. What's 365 plus 17? It's a lot of days, right? It's a lot of days. 385, 382. Thank you. Wow, man, I'm usually quicker than that. 
It's a long way. That's a long time to be on the boat. But it is through faith and patience that we inherit God's promised blessings. Through faith and patience, by humility. And Noah was willing to wait on the Lord. Noah and his family. So we see Noah heard from God. Right? Noah heard from God. Noah's inner self was stirred in different ways. His whole faith, all of his person was stirred for God. They obeyed God in the waiting. They obeyed God in the reckoning. They obeyed God. And then we see God bore witness about them. If we go back to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, by faith, God bore witness about them, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. God honored their faithfulness. God honored their faithfulness. If you skip over to... Verses 20 through 22 of chapter 8, we see then Noah built an altar. This is after they got off the boat, right? They sent the bird out. The bird brought an olive branch back. And so, so they, knew, they knew that there was dry ground somewhere. And they get off the boat. And Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of a man, because of man. For the intentions of man's heart is evil from its youth. Parents, say amen. Just kidding. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. God honored the faithfulness of this family. If we fast forward, I want you to see something from Matthew. Have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, it'll be up on the screen. Matthew chapter 26. I want you to see what Jesus does here with the flood. Matthew chapter 24, excuse me, verses 36 through 44. Jesus is praying in Gethsemane. Excuse me, Matthew 24. Sorry, why did I go to 26 again? Matthew 24, 36 through 44. We see Jesus talking here. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, not the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So, so I want you to see what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is using Noah and the flood to talk about his return, right? To talk about his return. I love, I, I love, I don't really love it. Actually, it kind of grieves me. Um, but, but, but growing up and hearing stories and seeing books of people predicting, right? Jesus is coming back here. Jesus is coming back here. You remember Y2K? I remember exactly where I was, right? Because a bunch of people believed that when that clock struck midnight, we were in 2000, Jesus was coming, right? And I remember kind of being ready. Like, like I remember at 1155, repenting of some things and just making sure everything was all good in the hood. And then, and then midnight hit and, and nothing happened, right? What, what, what am I getting to? No one knows! No one knows! No one knows! And that's not the point. What Jesus is getting to here is He's saying, listen, listen, as was with Noah... So is with you. No one knows. And so he says in verse 42, Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. What he's saying there, when he says stay awake, stay faithful. Stay faithful. Right? Stay faithful. Now's not the time where you say, Oh, you know what? I'm going to take the next few years and I'm going to really enjoy life. And then I'll get right with God and I'll start going to church and I'll start doing this and I'll start, I'll start giving. I'll start, doing, I'll start doing all the things, right? No, 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 no. Jesus speaking here, using the flood as an illustration to say no one knows the coming, so stay awake. For you do not know the day 
your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would have not broken, would have not let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour. You do not expect. Wow, Travis, this is kind of dim and grim. This is kind of hellfire and brimstone. Well, hello, Scripture. You can't, it's, it's right here. Like, like I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be doom and gloom. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be necessarily hellfire and brimstone. I'm just trying to be a gospel-centered preacher preaching the Word, saying things that are right here that we don't know the day or the hour, but our responsibility is to stay faithful no matter what. Stay faithful. I mean, I mean, think about it. Let's, let's get real for a moment, right? Pastor's about to go on sabbatical. Next week's his last Sunday before sabbatical. We got 12 weeks of freedom. We can go to the beach. We'll take, you know what? God's called us to 12 weeks of rest too. Now, I'm not God, but I'm just going to say, Jesus uses the story of Noah to tell his people to stay awake. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. And you know what the challenge with this is, I think, is stay faithful with our whole person. In the same way that Noah's whole self was stirred by God to respond, his mind, his heart, which would be you know, all of his being, and then his, his will. In what ways is God stirring in your heart, and how are you responding? In what ways, don't even put the S on the end, in what way is God stirring in your heart, and how are you responding? How is God Raising that flag for you in your mind. How is God pointing that putt out for you? And you're just sitting there, well, God, I, I see that, that, that you think it's going to do that, but I really think it's going to do this, and so I'm going to put it this way. Don't! Missed it. In what ways is God trying to get your attention? And how are you responding? Jesus uses the flood to warn people to be ready for His return. You don't know the day. Don't know the hour. Where is God trying to get your attention and how responsive are you? Noah's faith influenced his whole family. And they were saved. But it also condemned the whole world for his faith revealed their unbelief.